here with the wine dude, tasting as you go. We're here at Foxen with one of the winemakers and owners, Bill Wathen, correct? That's right. Okay, Bill Wathen. You got a great place to work here. Oh yeah, thanks. You enjoy it? Oh yeah, I love it. It's a great place to work. Great place to hang out. Uh, kind of in the middle of Fox and Canyon here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the winery and maybe a little bit of the history? Sure, this winery was established in 1985 by Dick DeRay and myself. This property has been in Dick's family's hands since the 1830s. His wow. great-great-grandfather was Benjamin Foxen, who was a English merchant mariner who kind of ended up in Santa Barbara, fell in love with a young Spanish lady, became a Mexican citizen, and purchased the, uh, or was given, or appropriated the Rancho Tinicuac land grant in 1835, and Dick is seventh generation right here in Santa Barbara County. So we were able to utilize the existing buildings here at Rancho Tinicuac for the winery. Great. This actual building we're in here was built in the 1880s by Dick's great-grandfather, Frederick Wickenden, who was Benjamin Foxen's son-in-law, another Englishman. So they used this room for anything besides storing Well, water? it was a horse barn. A horse barn, yeah, there we go. Know, the stagecoach ran through here on its way to Santa Barbara. Oh, that's cool. And they'd stop and water the horses here, but this, he had draft horses in here, and uh, in fact, some of his, some of Foxen's original draft horses were the first horses to pull the trolleys up in San Francisco. Ah. And those, they had the actual anchor brand on them, the horses did. Well, what does this anchor stand for? That was his cattle brand. Ah. So okay. that's Foxen's logo is, is Foxen's original uh, cow, cattle brand. I didn't realize there was so much history here. That's great. I noticed also across the, the way here that there's some vineyards. Are those part of your system? That's part of our system. That That's a little, one third of an acre of Cabernet that is called the Mamere Vineyard after Dick's mother. So my mother vineyard. Makes a intense eucalyptusy Cabernet because it's dominated by the eucalyptus tree that sits over it. Interesting. A so, good example of terroir there. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we drinking here? This is a 2003 vintage Bien Nacido Vineyard Pinot Noir from a block that was planted for Foxen in 1996 and 97 uh, called Block 8, the Ocho. Uh, so this is a block that it was planted for Foxen, uh, is specifically farmed for Foxen, and uh, it's a really nice uh, rendition of the Santa Maria Valley Pinot Noir Vineyard designate. So. Do you do a lot of the of the blending and, and why the grapes like delivered here and you just go ahead and I do a lot them? of the farming. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm I do farming for ourselves, uh, the Tinnacock Vineyard, the Williamson DeRay Vineyard, uh, the Ernesto Wickenden Vineyard, which is an old vine Chenin Blanc planted in 1966. And I also have direct direct farming decisions in all the blocks that we lease at Bien Nacido, at Vogelzang Vineyard, which is in Happy Canyon. So I'm directly involved in all the farming operations for fruit being grown by us or for us, and then involved in all the winemaking. Okay, so you're growing grapes for a lot of different wineries. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, just for Fox. Oh, it's all for Fox. It's all for Fox. Ah, okay, okay. So I'm the Fox and Wine Grow. The Fox and Wine Grow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, let's take a taste here. Oh, that's good. We're gonna bring a lot of people up here. 2003 Pinot Noir? 2003 Pinot Noir. Uh, they better get here quick, because it's almost gone. <laughs> <laughs> so how much wine do you produce in this, in this winery? This vintage, we're looking at about 12,000 cases. 12,000 cases. And okay. about, 30 to 40 percent of that is Pinot Noir. Really? Yeah. And then Syrah, Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc, and Cabernet Sauvignon, and bits and pieces of uh, Merlot and Sangiovese. That's great. One thing I noticed coming up here too, I don't see a lot of signs saying Fox and Winery. 
this well, way. Well, you know, there's not a lot of billboards in Fox Canyon. Or yeah, that's true. Not, I thought that was interesting. Not a lot of neon either. It's almost like you have to know to come here. Yeah, they, you know, it's, uh, it's a magical place. It and, is a magical place. And that's why we're bringing you here with the Wine Deep, tasting as you go. We're here inside of Foxen's Tasting Room, basically a shack on the side of the road of Foxen Canyon Road. We're here with Jenny Duray. She's one of the wine owners of the winery here, and she's gonna go through a couple of the wines here and maybe give us some history of Foxen Winery. How you doing? Hi, it's good to see you. Thanks, Thanks for, for help, helping us out here. You're very welcome, glad you came. Glad you found us. Yeah. <laughs> Not it's, so easy to do. It's quite a quite a trek to get up here. It is. But right. you know, it's a lot of fun getting here. Yeah. Well, as, you know, as we say, it's, it, this is a magical spot. Uh, it's a me original Mexican land grant property on two thousand acres, and uh, this the shack um, that we affectionately call it uh, was a former blacksmith shop. Part of the family. It's, this building here is, is 180 years old and it's been in the family all that time. So we've got quite a bit of history here. We do. We have a lot of history. Not a lot of pomp and circumstance, but the history we have and wine. And wine. And wine. That's why we're here. Uh, good. So what do we got here? We have here our, our 2004 Tinnacock Vineyard Chardonnay. Uh, Tinnacock, this is the Rancho Tinnacock, where we are, which is an original Mexican land grant property. Uh, the vineyard was planted in 89 by my husband, uh, Dick DeRay, and his partner, Bill Wathan. And uh, the, these, uh, these vines have quite a history. They are sweet, what we affectionately call the Lar de Noche vines. These were stolen cuttings planted on its own rootstock in a completely uh, dry farm vineyard right above the uh, the winery here. Wait a second, this is illegal wine? <laughs> well, that adds to the, the, the mystique, but no, every winter vines, the, the dormant vines are cut. And so on the ground in, in all of the vineyards, you will find the cuttings, the canes, we call them. Okay. Um, and it's a very basic process. Uh, now you have fancy bench grafts and so on. But in the old days, you would just take cuttings from those vines and stick them in the ground. It's a pretty basic thing. And if it's in the right place, with the right varietal, magic happens. And in this case, uh, Chardonnay. It did. Yes. Mm. Oh, so there's a good. lot of intensity here. This is not your typical California Chardonnay. No, not at all. A lot of minerality to it, uh, extremely intense. And because we don't irrigate, uh, we get very small yields. So we can very often get less than a ton to the acre. So does that mean more control? More control, more intensity, um, heck to farm, because it is dry farm, right. just like Burgundy. Because we don't irrigate, um, we get extraordinarily small yields, a fraction of what most commercial vineyards get. Right. And because it's on its own rootstock, you get a lot more of the terroir. And that's a fancy word, which really just means the place. Okay. It's, it has a, a very strong sense of place here. Now I see the joke of what, what he was talking about before. Yes, so. there yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we make just a few hundred cases of the Chardonnay. Okay. In fact, um, our production ranges, depending on the year, anywhere from 8,000 in most we can do. Like this year was a very good year, particularly for Pinot Noir. Uh, Fox and produced almost 12,000 cases. 12,000. Yes, but we're very small. Not bad for just a small as, winery. Just as much as our our barn can hold. Is that how you judge everything? Yeah. How many crazy. barrels you can get into the barn? Exactly. And in Santa Barbara, we enjoy a variety of microclimates, so we can do we we do grow wonderful Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, but we also do really well with with Rhone, some Rhone varieties and some Bordeaux varieties that we farm farther inland where it's warmer. Right. And Bill's the in charge of all that. Yes. Um, my my uh, my husband teamed up with Bill Wathen in 85 and we started making wine here. Bill has uh, was a viticulturist by education and training and he learned winemaking from the father of French winemaking techniques in California, from Dick Graff, the founder of Shalone Winery, mm. uh, back in the late 70s, so a long time ago. Um, and that's the style of winemaking that we do here, very minimalist French 
uh, classically styled wines, yeah, even it, though we're in beautiful Santa Barbara County. But it's been practiced through the years, That's yeah, it. for a very long time. That's, That's why it. your wines are so good. Yeah, so we use the best um, best farming techniques, which Bill is in charge of, as well as the wine making, um, the best uh, best French barrels. And it's a very basic process, really. You know, the work is done in the vineyard. Right. Bill will tell you that. Um, and we're, as I say, we're at this special place. It's Maybe very it's magical here. Yes, it is. Thank you. Jen, have you taste? Um, probably what we're best known for are Pinot Noirs. We make four, three vineyard designates and a blend, and this is what we call our San Maria Valley. Okay. And this is a blend of our Bienvenido Vineyard and the Julius Vineyard, all of, uh, just grown just a few miles away from here, up okay. on the Santa Maria bench. So it all is in Santa Maria, San Maria. All within a few miles, yes, exactly. So this is a Santa Maria Valley Appalachian Pinot Noir, uh, and everything we do here is in very small lots. And our Pinot Noirs, uh, any of our, all of our reds, um, uh, nothing is fined or filtered which is very hard to do unless you're doing in very small lots. Right. As I say, we use only French barrels. And this, the Santa Maria Valley is uh, made in a style which is probably the most approachable, the most fruit dominant right. of our Pinot Noirs. Okay. And one of our most popular. Oh, very nice. So, Pretty, very distinctive um, spice element, bright red fruit, really comes through. Now, this is very young wine. This was bottled uh, only three months ago. Oh. Which is a very short time for Pinot Noir to be in the bottle. So, uh, what do you suggest if we were to buy that wine? How long would you leave it in the bottle? Before you drink it? Before, well, <laughs> not before you drink it. It's optimum point before uh, you drink it. Good point. Um, <laughs> This, because it's it's more of the, of the fruit dominant, um, most approachable of our Pinot Noirs, I would say it's gonna settle down quite a bit in the next few months. Okay. And from there on, over the next in three, five years. Okay. Um, 2004, wonderful vintage. We have some other Pinot Noir, our most well-known from the critic standpoint and the most highly acclaimed. Pinot Noirs is our uh, Bien Nacido Block 8 that Bill was talking about earlier. And this is a Block 8 is a block that was planted expressly for Foxen. We farm it, meaning we don't pay uh, for the fruit by the tonnage. Okay. We pay an acreage charge. We farm it precisely to Bill's specifications, and uh, this is a clonal selection. Hmm. So we okay. take the most intense lots, um, treat it a little different with the barrel regime because it's more structured, more complexity, spends longer t in, in barrel and lotter, longer in bottle before we release it. So this is what you guys drink. <laughs> Well, it depends. You know, <laughs> if I were having salmon. Salmon, okay. All right. Um, I would pull this. This is what I, you know, drink all the time. Uh, seared ahi, salmon, pork. If I'm having that duck. Mm -hmm. um, something with just more oomph with a cherry sauce. You know, I'll go here. Yeah. I do but taste then, a lot of cherry in this. Yes, yeah. very distinctive. And this is also from the Santa Maria Valley. Okay. So, uh, but you get more oak, more structure, more tannins, um, more complexity, a little less fruit forward. Right. Um, but just different. You know, we make four Pinot Noirs, and, you know, if I say which one is my favorite, it depends on what my mood that, that day, yeah, exactly. what I'm having. Right, yeah. Sort of like asking which of my kids are my favorite. <laughs> it depends on the day. <laughs> And we won't make you make that choice. Yeah, well, some days I do. <laughs> <laughs> really? Why is that? No, that's another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who has kids understands. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Mm. Um, See, now, that one I really like. 
Isn't that awesome? Yeah. That um, one's very good. You know, we've uh, this area has always been highly acclaimed for Pinot Noirs. Um, and, but I have to say, since the sideways phenomenon here, which was, the, there was a scene filmed here in the winery, and so we are part of that mm -hmm. legacy. We can't keep Pinot Noir in stock, and that's in part. Uh, are you having trouble uh, selling Merlot because of that? Um, you know, it's interesting. We actually had made the determination. We make tiny bottlings of, of Merlot. And you know what? I think we're turning heads. Um, we make a Foothills Reserve, which is a Merlot Cap Franc blend, mm. which is a right bank style. Right. And that's where most of our Merlot goes into. No, you know what? I We have no complaints about the movie. And okay. the <laughs> I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you don't. But hopefully the podcast will help you too. Yeah. Oh, I love Sooner it. Sooner or later, people you will know, hear of the wine, dude. You know what? I think what I think people embraced was our off the beaten path, uh, the character right. here, and you know we've always felt we've had a very strong following. It's always amazed me how many people have come here, sought us out, mm -hmm. which is not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, just because it is a special place. Right. And and that's really the concept of the wine dude also, is to, to show people that there are little places just off kind of a back roads approach. And that's what we've been doing this whole time, you know? Well, we really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys were here for us. Yeah, <laughs> him too. Mm. We're gonna have to take some of that with us. Right, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so that's those are our two Pinots, and that's why I was making that comment. Uh, we released the Bien Nacido Block 8 last month. Mm -hmm. It's almost sold out, which wow. just is, you know, um, it's a little wild. A little, you know, I, we expect that to slow down, but the cool thing is for us, if it introduces Sideways and you guys introduces uh, Pinot Noir to more people and demystifies it because it is such a, awesome grape oh it yeah makes it um those of us who make pinot noir we do it because we're passionate about it um and it's the hardest grape to grow the hardest wine to make and it's the most sat satisfying when it's done right oh yeah yeah and actually just so you know you'll be a stop on our tour too we're going to be doing the wine dude upside down tour oh really Yes. Just take it one step uh -huh. further. And our okay. first one's going to be in a few weeks, the week after um, the week after Thanksgiving. Cool. So we'll be here with quite a few people. All we'll right. be filming and everything and to show people what the tour is about and again to revisit all the wineries that we have on our on our show. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's great. I so love what it. We got here. So, Cuvée Jean Marie, um, you met Bill. Right. Winemaker. Jean Marie is Bill's mother. Mm -hmm. um, she, Jean Marie deserves a wine in her honor because she bore nine children, wow. seven boys. Wow. So Bill is one of nine children. So uh, she deserves a wine, that's and for she's, sure. Yeah. Uh, awesome lady. Um, Cuvée Jean Marie is our Rhone blend. This is predominantly Syrah. Um, it's got a little bit of Mouvedre in it, 27%, and a tiny bit of Viognier, 2%, that was co-fermented with, uh, with the Syrah. Oh, interesting. So um, a typical blend of the Southern Rhone region, really. So it's... So does, does Jean Marie, does she drink a lot of this wine? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Are all her kids After, grown up, right? With, with seven sons, I, she deserves all the wine she can drink. <laughs> Crazy seven. Yeah. So, like our Pinot Noir and any of our other reds, uh, we make just a few hundred cases of this, um, and and this wine is not fined or filtered, and only French barrels. Yeah. And so. you know what? It's it's one of those wines that's easy to drink. It is. You know. A lot of intensity, black pepper, you know, bright plum, but and some earth that structure. Yeah. Um, I noticed that a lot out here with a lot of the wineries. You get a lot of our red wines that, that come out of here are very earth tasting, very earthy. Yeah, well, you know, like classically that. styled Rhone varieties um, have that earthiness. 
which is an important element. It should never be just about fruit. So do they throw earth into the presses <laughs> with it? Or? You would think so. You would think so. And in this case, I think there are some of the earthiness comes from the Mubedra. Okay. Which is it's kind of softens the mid palate. What's cool about all of the Rhone varieties, be it Syrah or Rhone blends, um, they're great food wines. Uh -huh. They're not overly tannic, a lot of intensity of flavor. This is a great barbecue wine. Right. That's yeah, that's and what I was saying. I'm, it's if really I'm easy to drink. A barbecue with some with some peppered um, elements to it. You know, that's the stuff. This is what you pull out, yeah. It's good wine. Thank you. You should try some of this, Danny. But if you have time to taste one more. Oh, wait. We, yeah, we got time. <laughs> All right, and since we're in the familial um, mode here and you've just tasted the Cuvée um, Jean Marie, I'm going to have you try the Williamson Doré okay. Syrah. Um, I'm Williamson, my husband's Doré. This is our little estate vineyard. Your magic. Our little magic. And it's 100% Syrah. So you're going to taste a slightly different personality. 100% Syrah? 100% Syrah. Wow. Uh, from our little four acre vineyard. So, like our other wines, it's a very small production wine. Um, also, the 2002. So, different personality. Right. Definitely. So, where you had maybe a little more, I think, of the Cuvée Jean Marie is a little more feminine in style for a Syrah. Um, this is definitely more masculine. It's got well, then we better try some of this. Yeah. Mm hmm Much bolder. Much bolder. The spicy kick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that. So um, I would have this, you know, anything from a steak, a peppered uh, pork loin, something with a little more intensity. You're making me hungry, you know Yeah, that? I do that. <laughs> a, a do you do a lot production? of cooking? We do. Yeah. We do. Uh, my husband Dick is the is the has become the chef, the official chef of uh -huh. the family. Uh, but you know, winemakers, we love to cook. Yeah. Just, you know, eating and drinking go together. Well, that's artistry. That's it. That's all it is, right? That's it. Yeah. I'm the same way. And we, I know, and I think that if you do wine well, it goes with food. It's just a natural well, yeah. byproduct of it. Plus, if you don't have food, you get really drunk, and then there you, go. you know you can't have as much wine. But you know, you know, the thing is, is you, you to really fully appreciate wine. I think it's best with food. Sure. It's a funny, it's a different element other than spirits. Wine takes on personalities. When well, you, plus when, when, you, when you have wine, you're, I mean, you're comparing it to food. Yeah. I mean, in, in many, many cases, you know, and smells, maybe flowers, but mostly to food. Yeah. And, you know, and I don't think there's any big science to it or something for people to be uh, intimidated by. It's really, um, wine and food pairing is really what you like. Right. And it's about trial and error and, and lots of trial. Yeah, well. <laughs> and, and, and fun. You know, it's just, sure. it should be fun. It, should, it shouldn't be intimidating. Well, that's what this whole thing's about. Yeah. I'm, trying, I'm trying to show the public that it's fun to taste wine. That's the whole idea. Um, you know, the snobbiness of it, the, the uh, I mean, you can do that if you want to, but really the, the key is to have a good time and that's what I'm hearing from you yeah exactly so so that's a that's a pretty good lineup I think so there you go I'm happy <laughs>
Unfortunately, no. I think there was probably a little home brew at the time, but other than uh, that, that'll work. Guys, that's uh, okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did it have but grapes? A few. A few. A few, but uh, not not uh, More like wine the clear, grape. the clear looking. The old, yes. yes there were some. Okay. There's some old vines you. here on the ranch, but the the winery and the vineyard as we know it today has been here only 20 years. Uh, but the ranch is, a, is the historic, Rancho Tinnacock has been owned by this family since 1837. Wow, 1837. Yeah. Um, you were telling me some kind of a history about the original Foxen. Oh, yeah. Benjamin Foxen, who is Dick's great-great-grandfather, is an important figure in Santa Barbara County history in that he's the first Anglo landowner. He was originally a, a, a sea captain. In a, British sea captain mer turned merchant mariner Great. who comes to Santa Barbara in the 1830s and he's introduced to the youngest daughter of the regional governor. This was, of course, a Mexican state. Uh, he falls in love, converts to Catholicism so he can marry Eduarda, and her father, who was the regional governor, arranges for him to purchase this Spanish land grant, then Mexican land grant. He also sees the, the, um, the importance of the English in California mm -hmm. and teams up with Fremont and, and helps his troops capture Santa Barbara. Uh, okay. And, and then make, uh, paving the way for California to become a state. But uh, having said that, his, uh, his daughter, Ramona, he had 18 children, 14 of whom lived. 18 children. And his daughter, Ooh. Ramona, marries another Englishman, and they build this ranch okay. that we are at today. So our tasting room, our fancy tasting room, was the former blacksmith shop. The barn is now our winery, and these are all buildings that are almost 180 years old. Wow. And the house you see behind you is the old homestead. So it's, we've been, a, Rancho Tinnacock and Foxen have been around a long time a long in these time. parks. Great, great. All right, well, thank you for that. Well, Thanks for thank having you. us. Thank and, you. Um, you know, Come we back. hope to hear if you get it. We're gonna be bringing the wine dude upside down to her here. Cool. And um, thanks for joining us. This is the wine dude, tasting as you go. Wine Dude here giving you directions to Foxen Vineyard. They are located at 7200 Foxen Canyon Road. From Los Angeles, take the 101 North to Santa Barbara. Exit at Route 154. Go over San Marcos Pass all the way to Foxen Canyon Road. Turn right. Follow Foxen Canyon Road until you see a shack on the side of the road. That's Foxen. From San Francisco, take the 101 South to Santa Maria. Exit Bataravia. Turn left onto Foxen Canyon Road until you see a shack on the side of the road. That's Foxen. Go inside and taste their wines. They're awesome, especially the Pinots. Well, there you have it. Thanks for joining us at Foxen Vineyard, our next official Wine Dude podcast. I want to thank Jenny DeRay and Bill Wathen for their time and their wine. You can find Foxen on the web at www.foxenvineyard.com. And remember... If you don't know Foxen, you don't know Dick or Bill. Check out the website at www.thewinedude.com. Get information about the wineries we visit, download our podcast, check our future episodes on some great California wineries. Also, look for the Wine Dude's Upside Down Tour podcast and book your next vacation wine tasting with the Wine Dude. And join me, the Wine Dude, tasting as you go.